I call this workforce readiness and economic vitality committee uh, to order. Uh, due to concerns over exposure to the coronavirus, the city has implemented measures to protect our community, including the closing of council chambers and limiting public attendance to electronic means only. Members of the public may attend the meeting virtually through Cisco WebEx events or view the meeting recording by visiting tempe.gov forward slash WREV for more information. Um, the second item on our agenda, um, call, call the order and roll call. Everyone's here, we're good. Um, the second item on our agenda for our committee meeting is approval of the minutes from our August 27th meeting. House member Aridano Savage, do you agree with our minutes? Look good to me, Vice Mayor. Thank you very much. Um, the next item on our agenda is public comments. Uh, Council 8 Alex Chin, do we receive any comments? We did not receive any comments at this time. Okay. Um, let's see here. Uh, moving on to section four under current items and updates. Item A1 is Copper State Farms development projects. So I want to call upon Copper State Farms for a quick presentation to share their ongoing development projects in Tempe and how they impact and serve our community and economy. Thank you very much, uh, Vice Mayor Keating, uh, other members of the council and staff. I uh, appreciate the, the time and the opportunity to, to present to you all today. Uh, I'm used to doing these types of things in person, so uh, bear with me if I have any uh, technology issues. But just give you a brief update uh, uh, as to what Copper State and Soul Flower dispensaries are up to in the city of Tempe and uh, some uh, thoughts on where we're headed with uh, economic development in the region. So I'll go ahead and share my screen now. Okay, can everybody see that? Not yet. No, there we go. Let's there we go. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, Soul Flower Dispensaries is part of the Copper State family of brands. Uh, Copper State Farms uh, is a, a company that's started about four years ago, uh, or four and a half years ago now. Uh, one of our managing directors and founders is Fife Symington IV, uh, Arizona native and, and son of the former governor of Arizona. Uh, he has a long history of uh, being successful in, uh, in agriculture and particularly greenhouse agriculture. So uh, he and uh, the, our investors purchased the, uh, the greenhouse, uh, existing greenhouse facility up in Snowflake, Arizona that was uh, abandoned. <laughs> it was a previously a cucumber and tomato facility. And uh, we have since uh, invested a great deal of money and effort into uh, transforming that greenhouse into the largest cannabis greenhouse uh, in, in the United States. Uh, it operates in Snowflake, Arizona, where Copper State Farms is one of the largest private employers in the entire region. Uh, Soul Flower is the dispensary brand that we operate. Uh, we operate uh, four locations currently in the greater Phoenix area. Uh, we have one on uh, McClintock, uh, just north of uh, the 202, uh, Tempe University, just uh, east of the uh, 143, and we have uh, uh, locations in North Scottsdale Air Park as well as in Sun City. Uh, the picture you see there is an uh, interior of our Sun City Wellness Center. Uh, that was a dispensary that was built from scratch by us. We put about $2 million into that facility. Uh, it is very high end and, and it's meant to be very inviting. Uh, it is combined with a, a wellness uh, cafe and a multi purpose wellness room where we have all sorts of uh, educational classes, uh, such as yoga and meditation, Tai Chi, and then uh, the cafe next door where you can uh, uh, purchase a, a wellness uh, type uh, food and beverage that is non medicated. Uh, and that cafe is outside the bounds of our dispensary. So the public can come in, uh, take a look at the dispensary without having to, to commit to actually going into a dispensary if they're a little too afraid to do that yet. Uh, our commitment to the city of Tempe and to every city in which we operate is 100% uh, compliance, both from a local level, a state level, a DHS rules level, and of course, uh, good corporate citizenship. Uh, we are currently in the process of completely renovating the 2424 West University location. It, it is a, a warehouse that was built in the 60s, uh, and the previous operator opened a dispensary there, but really put uh, very little into the, into the space and kind of 
opened it up with a, a laptop and a card table and some some jewel cases. So uh, we are hoping that this will be uh, one of our flagship locations along with the Sun City Wellness Center. Uh, and you can see some of the, the, the uh, renderings here of what that uh, facility will look like. Uh, it'll be a 5,000 square foot dispensary. And then uh, uh, about, a, I think it's a 30,000 square foot uh, back of the house uh, where we will do all sorts of manufacturing and processing activities. Uh, that we are putting approximately $6 million into this project. Uh, it's currently under uh, review with the, or part of, part of our, our permits are under review with the city of Tempe. Uh, and uh, we're, we're excited that uh, once it's finished, it will really enhance the curb appeal of the building. It'll allow for more parking, which is currently limited on the site. Uh, and it also will uh, create a, a significant number of new jobs uh, more as we move some of our processing, packaging, uh, distribution activities down to the back of the house in Tempe rather than in Snowflake. So we anticipate that it'll be at least 25 uh, to eventually 50 new jobs uh, in the back of the house there. Uh, and of course, uh, this is an area that the, the, the city has uh, focused on uh enhancing the the look of it right here on university uh, we are also undertaking some renovations at our uh, mcclintock location uh, that is currently our busiest store and one of the busiest stores in the entire state uh, i believe we were uh top three in the state uh for sales at this tiny little location uh you might be familiar with the site 1322 north mcclintock it used to be a a, a, a uh, maintenance yard for Ollie the trolley. Uh, and so it was a old single family home and, and, a, and a parking lot and some maintenance, outdoor maintenance sheds. Uh, we originally opened it up with uh, some, some pretty minor renovations on the inside just to try to get it open. And now we are uh, trying to update the outside as well. Uh, and unfortunately, I don't have any renderings of what that will look like, but we are adding retail space. Uh, adding a, another uh, uh, space for offices and for employee lounges, and then really improving the the look of the exterior by adding a nice uh, canopy shade structure and redoing the parking lot, uh, which is is really in in, in need for that. So, uh, if you're familiar with the area, this should uh, make the the property a lot a lot more beneficial for curb appeal and and uh, safety. And uh, we are uh, investing approximately a million dollars in this first phase, uh, and we expect at some point to come back to uh, to do further renovations because the building is old, and we will probably need to to do a new build there at some point. But for the time being, uh, this million dollar renovation project should uh, significantly enhance the property. Uh, just to give you a little idea of our, our economic impact in the city of Tempe, we uh, have 73 employees at, at McClintock, uh, currently our busiest store. We have 53 employees at Tempe University. And again, after our inspection, after our uh, expansion and, and renovations at the university, we anticipate at least uh, 25 and as many as 50 new positions uh, front and back of the house. So that would be, you know, approximately 100 employees at that location. Uh, combined, our two stores have a monthly revenue of approximately 3 million, uh, which results in sales tax of approximately 650,000 to the city of Tempe every month. Uh, another thing we're really focused on is community involvement uh, in all the locations in which we operate, but particularly in Tempe because of our, our footprint there. Uh, we've joined the Tempe Chamber. We were proud to be a, a title sponsor of the ASU Sun Devil kickoff. Uh, Despite my wildcat allegiance, <laughs> we were happy, happy to do that. And it was a great event. Uh, and we look forward to working with the Tempe Chamber uh, in the future. Uh, we also have joined Local First Arizona. And uh, we have had a commitment ongoing for quite some time now with the Last Prisoner Project. And, and that project uh, ensures that uh, industry, uh, marijuana industry uh, participants are, are helping to right the wrongs of the past and making sure that those that are still incarcerated for marijuana crimes are, are going to be released. Uh, so last year we donated approximately $100,000 to that, uh, that effort and we will uh, are on pace to do about the same this year. Uh, in addition, uh, Andrew Myers, who has been our, our great liaison with the, with the town, uh, has uh, mentioned to us that there's a, a need for the 
uh, Tempe pre uh, project and we're excited and open to talking to the council about that and how we can help with that. Uh, lastly, I just want to say that, uh, you know, we had these. <laughs> These con construction projects are very complicated from a regulatory standpoint because we've got so many uh, intertwined pieces here with the Department of Health Services, with the city and its regulations, and of course dealing with a, a subject that uh, uh, you know until recently was legal, illegal. Uh, so it's uh, for it creates a lot of challenges uh, from a administrative level. Uh, and from getting these projects across the line, uh, in addition to the fact that we we sort of took over the the university uh, property uh, from a uh, a previous owner and a previous operator. So uh, we are working through some of those issues with your staff. Um, we have run into a couple of difficulties, but we're real uh, thankful that the staff has uh, has helped us try to get those across the line and, and we're just a really appreciative of the of the city being a, a great partner for us and we're hopeful to be a great partner to the city going forward. Um, again, my name is Ryan Hurley, uh, general counsel here at Copper State Farms. If you have any questions, I'm happy to take them now or you can email uh, and, uh, and or call me at any time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Hurley. Um, council member Aaron Dando Savage, you have any comments or questions? Yeah. Hey, thank you, Vice Mayor. Ryan, thank you. Very nice to meet you uh, digitally. Very cool. Thank you. You did a great job. I know we're not in person, so I just want you to know solid work. Nicely done um, and certainly do appreciate it. I thought you did a really great job just kind of putting this together and so people can understand a little bit about what your business is and what you do and the impact that you're having on the community. And, and it's not just about jobs. I mean, it's it's the fact that you're renovating and taking care of that area where you're at and uh, putting some more dollars into that. and. And, and love that you've jumped on board, like with the chamber and local first. And I didn't know, if, I'd, I'd like to know more about that last prisoner project. Um, kind of 1 of the things that uh, I worked a little bit with the national league of cities. So I'd be curious to know kind of what your thoughts are in, in regards to that. And, and then your offer of, of Tempe pre and what that looks like. So, I mean, just, I, I just thought it was really informative and really do appreciate it. You talked about being good partners both ways. I mean, what, what can the city do to help you be more successful and. And what have you seen that's working or where do you feel like uh, we could do a little bit better? Uh, thank you, uh, Vice Mayor, Council Member Arredondo Savage. Uh, yeah, we, uh, you know, the, as I mentioned before, these these administrative challenges are, 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 are sometimes uh, <laughs> vague and, and difficult to approach just because of the, the nature of the, the business and also because of the, the sometimes conflicting uh, issues between the city and the Department of Health Services. So one issue that we're we're uh, trying to deal with right now uh, is the um, the fact that the the facility at 2424 West University was partially completed when we took it over from the previous uh, operator, uh, and there were some open uh, open building permits and a partially completed CFO that we never got from the previous owner. So we uh, last week we had a great meeting with Ryan LeBake from your planning department and uh, Ryan has, uh, has pledged to us to track that down. Uh, the other thing that the city has done, which we gratefully, greatly appreciate is to uh, uh, co-track both of our approvals for our building plan review and for our marijuana use application. So. Uh, at times on our end, it, it feels like uh, some of the some of the administrative burdens are a little high, but but we're working through them, and uh, your staff has been responsive, so we appreciate that. Hey, well, just know, Ryan, you, we're not being selective by any means. I mean, I I, I would say I appreciate our staff and, and keeping those expectations high, and uh, really just ensuring that you know our businesses are high quality. So just know that hopefully you're getting the great service that I know that they they very that they have provided and do provide to our businesses. And and I know that the vice mayor and I are here, and it's always good to hear new businesses when they come in, kind of how things have, have gone, not just what you're doing in the community, but what the city's doing right and, and what we could do better better on, because that's the only way that we know. You know, we definitely don't know what we don't know. So I think you being thank you for being forthcoming with that and hopefully you'll work with staff and, and get through those those little little uh, hurdles. You know, that's that's all they are. Exactly. Just more appreciation for what you get once you get it, right? For sure, and we we certainly appreciate that. And and like I said, the, the the best part has been how responsive they've been to our needs. So we we really appreciate that. Yeah, and I love the fact that too. If you take the time and and whatever it is you feel like you'd like to be interested in in the city of Tempe, what works for you is is always good for us. So if you find something that we're doing that you'd like to be a part of, 
whether it's, you know, pre-K, veterans, you know, workforce, any of those things, um, absolutely, you know, we would welcome um, not just, of course, your, your sponsorship or support, but actually time and commitment, which sometimes is always hard to do. I know that, but would be would be greatly appreciated too. And we're always open minded and certainly do appreciate it. And welcome to Tempe and and uh, look forward to a long long time partnership. Thank you very much. And <clears throat> yes, we're open to uh, all of those uh, 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 potential avenues of participation as well. And uh, our staff is excited to get out and do things. We we sponsor an Alzheimer's walk, which a lot of our folks at uh, Sun City participated in recently. Uh, and uh, one thing that we have on the horizon is uh, is partnering with some of these new social equity applicants that the Department of Health Services is going to be issuing new licenses to. I know the city may be approached by some of those folks to zone some new dispensaries, and uh, we are looking at partnering with some of them to do a, a social equity uh, manufacturing incubator that I think the, the city of Tempe would be a great location for. So uh, maybe we can talk about that at a future date. Yeah, that would be awesome. So I, I just have, I'm just curious, because I don't know very much about your, your business and what you do. What does like a, a typical day look like in the sense of people coming in? And, you know, how many visitors do you have uh, through the doors a day? Let's just go with the McClintock location, because obviously that's one that's been up and running. And then do you guys do delivery? Is that still a thing that's that's happening? And, and what does that look like? Yeah, so McClintock, we will see as many as a thousand people a day come through that tiny little store. So it's really uh, impressive, uh, you know, at full peak and in the spring uh, or in the fall when when Arizona is, is rocking. That's how many people will get through there. Um, we had uh, started a delivery pilot program, which delivery is available for medical patients, not for uh, adult use patients at this time. Um, but unfortunately, it was um, it was very hard to administer. The risk was very high and. Uh, it was uh, it was something that we felt we had to put on pause for the time being until we could uh, figure either either roll in adult use or figure out a way to um, to scale it and operate it a little bit more efficiently. So right now we are not doing any deliveries. I do note that uh, one of our competitors uh, that is in the county island just uh, just to the uh, west of us, Sunday Goods. I believe that they are planning on doing a drive through, uh, which your code temp uh, currently prohibits. So. Uh, that might be something that we ask uh, you to take a look at in the future uh, to make us competitive with the, the county island dispensary that's uh, you know a little over a mile to the west. Yeah, yeah, very familiar with that. So I'm definitely not not necessarily about the drive through, but I'm sure we will hear more about it. <laughs> so <laughs> I appreciate that. Okay, and just one last question, Ryan, of like the thousand people that come through, what do you say the percentage of them are medical marijuana um, card holders? Yeah, so I mean that that number was actually right uh, right when REC was trans transitioning. So the vast majority of those folks are still medical card holders, but uh, we've started to see the the renewal rates for those dip off a little bit. Uh, and so I think we're pretty close to fifty fifty right about now in that split. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Well, you know, thank you. You know where to find us. So anything that we can do to enhance a relationship and partnership, uh, you know, please let us know. So awesome. thank you for taking the time. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Of course, I'm going to stop letting you go first because you always steal all my thunder. So. <laughs> We're such a good team. <laughs> oh, yeah. You covered a lot of what, of what I was going to ask and say, but I just want to, you know, say to Mr. Hurley and, and um, you know, Copper State, you know, we really appreciate you guys investing in Tempe and being in Tempe and any business we have is, is a welcome business. So, um, you know, uh, we're excited not only that you're here, but you're spending money on renovating your buildings, you know, beautification is big in Tempe. We, we like our code enforcement. We like our pretty buildings. Um, so I'm very much, um, you know, appreciative of that. Any sort of community partnership is fantastic. Um, especially, you know, Tempe pre is something that's near and dear to me. In fact, we're going to have a discussion about Tempe pre right after this item. If you want to hang on and just kind of see what it's all about. For sure. um, you know, it's been a, a huge success story. Um, you know, but we're kind of, we're trying to figure out like what it's going to look like in the future. So, you know, any role that, that anyone can play in that is certainly a welcome um, addition. So I really um, appreciate you guys taking a look at that program as well. And as council member Aaron Dowdle Savage says, anything the city can do to make, you know, operating your businesses easier for you in the long run. Um, you know, we're happy to take a look at that. Um, we are a business friendly community out here in Tempe. So, um, you know, we certainly don't want to. Um, bog anyone down or create hurdles that are unnecessary. So feel free, keep the lines of communication open and feel free to let us know if anything we can ever do for you. I do appreciate um, the presentation though. I, I didn't know that you guys were having such a big impact in Tempe already. So that's great. Thank you, Vice Mayor. I appreciate it. Absolutely. 
All right. Look at you, Vice Mayor. Look how efficient you are. Nicely done. Let's move along. Let's, Let's do it. Along. Let's go. Oh, do you want me to go or are you going? Vice Mayor, are you still there? I was on mute. <laughs> ah. I was going to say something okay. really smart alecky, but I won't. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. Okay, we'll start again. <laughs> So, the next item under section 4A4 4 is item A2, Tempe Pre. One of the priorities of um, this council committee is to explore potential long term funding opportunities for the Tempe Pre program. Last month, staff provided us with an update, and both council member Aaron Savage and I had some follow up questions. So, staff is here to kind of to follow up with us on the information we requested and, and uh, give us um, in a little bit more details than, than last month. So, I'll turn it over to staff uh, for that presentation. Hello, Vice Mayor, uh, Council Member. This is your Council Aide, Alex Chin. Um, one of the things that were on the table uh, last month was a potential doing a, a tax ballot initiative. So I thought it was very important that we bring um, Ken Jones, uh, Chief Finance Officer, uh, to this meeting today to kind of give you that base information as well as Carla Reese, uh, Tempe City Clerk on the uh, the strict timeline uh, to make it to that ballot if that is the um, direction uh, that's up for discussion. So with that, I will pass it on to uh, Ken Jones. Thanks, Alex. Hey, everybody. Uh, so I had a pretty simple role in this. I was just asked to estimate uh, what the sales tax would produce if we were to increase it by some amount. So I started with the 0.1%, which is increasing it from 1.8 to 1.9. And that would, uh, if we had done that last year, it would have generated about 9.4 million. And based on our projections, if we were to do that in fiscal year 23, 24, which seems like the likely date that you would implement a new tax, uh, it would generate uh, as the slide says, between 10 and a half and a million dollars, uh, $11 million. So I, I just pr provided those estimates to Alex and happy to join the discussion if more detail is needed. Thank you, Ken. Carla, are you there? I'm here. I was waiting to see if you wanted me to talk yet. So I'm here to talk about the election timelines and the Arizona revised statutes 16 204 requires that any TPT uh, tax initiative be placed on a November ballot of an even year. So the 1st opportunity would be November of 2022. We do have to provide 150 days notice to the county which would require council to um, make that decision by May 26th of 2022 if they want to have a call of election. The language, the ballot language is also due soon thereafter on June 24th. We have a lot of publication deadlines. The slide kind of outlines that for you. Um, but if anyone has any questions on this timeline, you know, feel free to pass that forward. Otherwise, I just wanted you to be aware so you can reverse engineer if need be, or if you need to look at a 2024 election, I can provide you an updated timeline for that. Can we go back to that slide? I was having a hard time reading and understanding that timeline. Um, so, so November 8th. Okay, go ahead. November is the election, and if you see the minus 150, that means 150 days before the election. And then the due dates are here in the left column. Um, some of the language in there might be confusing, but go ahead and take a look. I know it's a little small because of the PowerPoint. Which, what is the day to, what is the day to decide if we're going to. Yeah, what are the key dates, Carla? That's, I'm with so you. May 26th, the council has to decide. Okay. Yeah. yeah. May 26th, okay. I mentioned the council will need to make their decision um, okay. if they want to have that call of election because that day by 5 p.m. I need to notify Maricopa County Elections Department. So 
the May 26th meeting is the last opportunity for council to make that call of election. But very soon thereafter, your ballot language is going to need to be uh, pretty nailed down for the questions, the measures and propositions. That deadline is June 24th. So those are very key deadlines as we're approaching an election season. I have some internal publication deadlines, but if council has met those two deadlines, we should be good. And then moving forward, there are just general deadlines for voter registration, early voting, sample ballots, textual corrections, and that type of thing. But those two key dates are May 26th and June 24th. So the, the first one says June 10th. Is that just an error then? That should be May 26th? So June 10th is the due date, but our last scheduled council meeting that would meet that timeline is May 26th. So that's why we have a little shorter deadline, May 26th. Okay. So, but you the one thing though, Vice Mayor, is I would say, you know, let's kind of, I, I wouldn't worry so much about what our scheduled meetings are, because if we do happen to go down that path, to me, it's about those hard deadlines. And then, yeah. you know what I mean? Because, right. I mean, we could always call for a special meeting if we needed to. I just didn't want to get people confused. Yeah. Like right. me. I was confused. So <laughs> if you were if you were to call a special meeting, it needs to be June 10th prior to 5 p.m. Because that's, that's when I have to notify the county. Time. You got it. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. All right. I understand now. Okay. Can um Alex or somebody, whoever, can we just get, you know, just in an email? I mean, or just send me this. Just send me this. The spreadsheet would be great. Um I know it's in this PowerPoint slide, but you know, I'd much rather have it in Excel format if, if you wouldn't mind. Sure, I'll send Alex the Excel so that he has that. And then I have a sample um, similar initiative that came out of Tucson in 2017. If you wanna look at some ballot language, we can send that to you as well. Yes, that'd be helpful, thank you. Sure. Hey, Carla, did they, they went out to ballot, right? I mean, they went out at the election and they didn't win that. Is that or they did they not lost? Get, they lost. They that. did. Yeah, yeah, they did lose that election. I think Tempe may have some more support and there was a little bit different political climate in Tucson in 2017. And mayor and council also had raises for themselves on the same ballot. So there was some backlash. Oh. Right. Associated uh, with some of that. So, how about also um, why, if you got that, that it, I'm sorry, Vice Mayor, can I ask a question? Yeah, <laughs> of course. Yeah, sorry, please. sorry. Um, I'm just wondering, are there any other ballot measures that you know of? You know, maybe talking with some of your colleagues that were that would incorporate like a pre-K, but not necessarily just 100% focused on pre-K. You know, maybe like quality look, of life tax. I know that's been thrown around with this council and just would like to explore maybe what some other cities have done just to get some ideas. Okay, I can look into that. Uh, Tucson's of that was right on point. It was early education, um, but I'll go ahead and I'll look into that a little bit deeper and see what else I can find that is in that genre. Right, and I guess my thought too on this vice mayor is, is I kind of worry about, you know, us going out for, uh, you know, something that's related to education, you know, because I know I, you probably just got hit up too by Kyrene to help support their override and things that they're doing. So I don't, I, I just, that's why I'm just asking just for a broad brush of what else is out there. Yeah, I understand. Cool. Thank you. Carla, Thanks, Carla. Do you happen, do you happen sure. to know what the, um, and if you don't, I can look it up after the meeting. What was the, what was the percentage of the vote for the Tucson um, election? Hold on, let me bring that up. I have it right here on my desktop, so I'll find out for you. That just no, means no I, way I don't, for you. I, <laughs> I don't have the vote outcome right here on my desktop. Like I thought it's on my other computer, so I will send that to you shortly. It's just, yeah, it's just, I'm just curious. I think it failed by a pretty significant margin, but again, it was political backlash. I don't think it was related to the program. Yeah, those greedy council members down in Tucson. Yeah, their only way to get a raise is through the chart. It, in their charter is to put it out to the voters, and they haven't had one in probably 20 some odd years. So <laughs> it's interesting. Wow. Huh. I don't Good think we have. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you very much, Carla. Robin, do you have anything else? No, nope, that's perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Carla, did you need to go over this slide? 
Yeah, that was just another mention. And I think I think these two council members are very aware of the state law prohibitions and we face that on our bond election as well. Um, the, we can put together factual publicity pamphlets, but city can't really propose for or against uh, the initiative and we can't use taxpayer resources to influence the outcome of the election, which it gets complicated, but just wanted a reminder out there. I know. Quick question. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so Carla, why we're doing it? I mean, I don't know, and maybe Alex, this might be something that we we could get some help with. Is could we kind of see what's kind of happened at the state level? I know uh, Keeley's mentioned a couple things. Maybe check in and see what's happened at the state level and at the federal level too, because um, if there's some things in the works, I think it would be really good to at least get them um, on our radar, and uh, you know, see how they might impact. Our Tempe pre program now and in the future. Is that are you referencing the possible federal funding for pre preschool? Yeah, right. I don't know okay. if that's even going to work or where that works out. Um, I know it's under discussion, but I don't know if they're going to embed that in another bill. I don't think it was in the omnibus omnibus bill they did for federal. Um, Budget recently, so, but I'll, I'll look deeper and see if I can find something about that or Marge, maybe of assistance there as well. Okay, good. And then I don't know too. And then I know something about uh, the red Fred folks working on some stuff. So maybe just check and see what they've kind of got. Um, in the mix would be helpful. Sure, we'll look into that on the state legislature as well. Okay, cool. Thank you. Okay, I don't have anything else, so we can move on with the presentation. Great, good afternoon. Uh, Marie Raymond, Human Services Manager, and um, I'm here with Ellie Burke, who's our Tempe Pre Supervisor. So we're just um, back to um, answer some questions that, that we were left with after our presentation last month. Next slide. And, um, and as we go through, um, please feel free. If you have any questions, please uh, jump on in or, or I'll, I'll just keep going through them. <laughs> so, um, so last time we ended our presentation with 3 recommendations uh, for the continuation of Tempe pre. Um, the 1st would be to maintain our current reduced capacity. So currently we have 11 classrooms serving a total of 198 children at a cost uh, to the city of 1.5 million. Um, the second recommendation was to restore the program back to its initial capacity of 20 classrooms, um, and that would be at a cost of 3.6 million. And then the third would be to expand access and capacity. And um, if we go with the uh, first scenario that um, that Ken proposed of the 9.4 million, that would allow us to serve approximately 940 children. Next slide. So, in terms of the breakdown of the Tempe pre budget, um, our current uh, 11 classrooms, the majority of the budget goes to our staff. Um, so, our teachers and our instructional assistants. Um, and then uh, we have staffing for our kids zone that provides before and after care. And, um, and then we have our nutrition costs, our supplies, our camp costs, um, and our city staff. So, in regards to the revenue for the program on the left hand side, you can see the total um, budget for the program is 1.933. Um, so the city's contribution is 1.5. We do bring in almost 330,000 is projected in tuition revenue. Um, we have um, other funding that we use to offset the cost of the program. So there's some um, state funding that um, some pass through funding from the federal government. Um, and then we've had some donations and sponsorships. Um, and then we positioned the program to be able to accept Department of Economic Security child care subsidies. So, um, so we will uh, start accepting subsidy payments as well. Next slide. 
So, um, so here's the, um, some of that other funding that I uh, referenced in the previous slide. So, along with kids zone, uh, we applied uh, for the state child care stabilization grant program. Um, so, um, we were awarded uh, 5,000 per site. So that, um, so we're looking at a total of 35,000 dollars a month um, because we have seven sites. And then um, just recently on September 16th, we applied uh, to access some of the American Rescue Plan Act funds to the state. Um, so we applied for $250,000. So um, we're, we're still awaiting um, the results of that application. Um, so these are uh, one-time funds though, however, so they're not um, funds that will be sustainable uh, year after year. Next slide. I'm gonna turn it over to Allie. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Um, so, since the beginning of the program, grants and donations have augmented the budget. And so, this slide is a review slide, really. Um, in addition to mayor and council's operational support of Tempe Pre, we've also received over 2 million in philanthropic and community support, largely for research and evaluation. Um, the Jerry Brock Foundation uh, donation was used to assist in program development, and the Virginia G. Piper Charitable Trust was used for initial startup operations to support quality first participation and teacher professional development and training. First things first has uh, generously offered to cover costs of our third party third party evaluator. And the Helios uh, Education Foundation invested in a longitudinal study of our Tempe pre children, uh, following them in their early elementary years to study the elements needed to sustain preschool momentum in learning um, that ultimately impacts third grade reading and math skills. Um, the Arizona Community Foundation and Garcia Family Foundation monies were donated in support of tuition fees and professional development. And then um, Helios recently provided a statement on the left to reiterate their support of Tempe Pre and our uh, city of Tempe's journey towards sustainability. Uh, however, you'll see in the note there that they do not directly fund our operational costs. I'll turn it back over to Marie. Um, so, uh, I know council members were interested in other Arizona preschool programs and how they're being funded. So, Flagstaff has a program called Elevate Pre-K. Um, they just launched their first classroom this year, um, and uh, they have a, a partnership and three-year commitment from City of Flagstaff, Coconino County, and the Wharton Foundation. Um, and um, Helios Foundation is also supporting uh, research and evaluation for them. And then they also received um, some monies from Arizona Community Foundation um, for some startup and uh, Flagstaff Unified also helped them with some startup costs. Um, just to put the program in perspective uh, at, at capacity, they're hoping to have a total of three classrooms. Um, so they have one currently. And then in Pima County, uh, the Pima Early Education Program Scholarships is a program that's just started this year. Um, that was a $10 million commitment uh, from, uh, from Pima County. And, um, and then uh, a million dollar commitment from city of Tucson and then monies uh, from the town of Marana and the town of Oro Valley. And um, that 11.165 million um, will um, will hopefully serve a little over 1200 children annually um, is what they anticipate, but they're just getting started on that. Next slide. Um, so, in terms of the evolution of Tempe Pre, um, the first uh, city council work group was formed in 2015. We conducted a, a feasibility study in 2016 to assess the need. Um, and then um, in 2017, council approved a two year pilot program. 
um, of uh, 20 classrooms with a $6 million commitment over the two years. Uh, we opened the 15 of those 20 classrooms in August of 2017 and added an additional five in January of 2018. So we were at our, our 20 classroom uh, max there and you can, um, and at that time, the for those first two years, uh, the program served families at or below 200% of the federal poverty level and the program was um, a fully subsidized tuition for all those families. In 2019, um, Council reauthorized the program for an additional two year pilot um, to open access to tuition paying families. And so, um, so in 2019, we included uh, both families who paid half tuition and families who paid full tuition. Half tuition families were those whose incomes were between 200 and 300% of the federal poverty level. And full tuition was anyone over 300% of the federal poverty level. Um, we also entered into an agreement in 2019 with Maricopa County Head Start, and they fund uh, 20 children in the program as well annually. Um, in 2020, uh, we responded to the pandemic and uh, we reduced capacity of the program um, across the city's um, budget reductions. And so the program size was reduced to its current um, uh, 11 classrooms serving 198 children. And, um, and in 2021, we are um, rebuilding and getting back up to capacity again. I do want to um, also note we never shut down during the pandemic. Um, Tempe Pre always continued throughout the pandemic to be there as a resource for families who needed child care to be able to work. Um, next slide. Um, just um, a note for poverty levels across the city. Um, when we look at access to high quality preschool, we try to know um, where those areas are of greatest need. And so, um, you know, no surprise to anyone um, where our highest poverty areas are and our lowest poverty areas. Um, and if you look, um, the number of quality preschools, and this includes the um, seven Tempe pre sites, we have 11 classrooms, but they're in seven locations. So our seven locations um, are um, included in that total. Um, and if you go to the next slide, please, Allie. So um, this is where the um, quality preschools were located before Tempe Pre. Um, then when we had our 20 classrooms at 11 sites, um, you can see where those uh, were located and uh, the final column is where we are currently. Next slide. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and take it back. Um, so our research team, NORC, looked at the background characteristics uh, across three co cohorts of uh, Tempe Pre students. And as you can see, um, you know, well, you can look at the slide, but what they found was in each year, 70 to 80% of our children are students of color. And if we go on to this next slide, um, the pie chart on the left reflects the demographics of the Tempe population, uh, while on the right, um, that reflects our current student population of Tempe pre-students. And when you're comparing the two, you can see there are more families of color that are accessing and qualifying for Tempe pre-services. And to kind of continue and connect to the slide, uh, previous slide, where NORC found 70 to 80% in each year were students of color. This year, we actually have 89% of our students are students of color. Turn it back over to Marie. Uh, so when we did our initial feasibility study, um, we found not enough children in poverty um, attend high quality preschool. So access is an issue. So if we um, note the number of three and four year old Tempe children in poverty, so this would be families at or below 200% of the federal poverty level, there are about 1242 um, three and four year olds who, who meet that category. Uh, we currently um, sponsor 130 of those children in Tempe Pre, so that would leave um, over 1,100 three and four year olds who are not being served by the program. Next slide. I know council members were interested to know um, what, what our wait list looked like. Um, so over time, um, in our first year of the program, uh, every family who uh, was asked, asked to um, 
access Tempe pre, we were able to accommodate in year 2, um, by the end of the year, we still had 73 families um, who were waiting to access the program who were not able to serve um, that increased to 153 um, in year 3. Um, year four was the pandemic, um, and so um, naturally we had uh, many families who were not accessing the program, so we were able to serve everyone who needed care. Um, and this year we currently have 136 families on our wait list. Um, out of those 136, 130 would qualify for free tuition and six would qualify for half. Next slide. Okay, so one of the questions uh, we also were asked is, how do we know how our kids are doing? So, uh, NORC created a couple of slides for us. Um, they looked at our kindergarten DIPL scores of former Tempe pre students and compared them to similar students who either A, went to another pre K program within the Tempe Elementary District, or B, did not attend any pre, -pre K program um, in Tempe Elementary District. The NORC findings were similar to other research that's out there uh, that shows children who attend high quality pre-K programs begin kindergarten with key basic skills ahead of their peers. Um, so you might be asking, why is this important? Well, it's important because it helps set them up for um, reading success and learning success over time. So on this slide, uh, similarly, uh, Tempe pre-students in the first cohort started kindergarten better able to isolate individual sounds, uh, which are also called phonemes. And they were doing this in nonsense words so that kids can't memorize words in the testing. Um, and uh, the children are doing um, better um, in Tempe pre-program. So, and this is again, a critical pre-reading skill. And this builds to this slide, which is super important because in the last two slides, we saw how Tempe pre students began kindergarten ahead of other, other students who did not attend pre K in Tempe elementary district. And here we see how they grew at a faster rate on a more advanced early literacy skill, which is fluency. Uh, so again, they're using nonsense words and being able to sound those words out is so difficult at this age uh, that we don't even assess it at the beginning of kindergarten. Uh, Mid-year students in all three comparison groups school, uh, scored close to zero. However, by the end of the year, you'll see that uh, shoot up there um, of the former Tempe pre-students, they made the biggest advances in this skill. And so that, that that's very exciting. Get yeah, back to Marie. Yeah, so then we'll just circle back to um, the slide we started with. So again, here were the three options that were presented the last time. And um, you know, hopefully we were able to answer um, the questions that you had and uh, we're happy to answer any more that you might have. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Councilman Arredondo Savage, do you have any feedback? Uh, yeah, I, but you know what? I don't want to rain on your parade, Vice Mayor. So if you want to go first, <laughs> I'm going to let you go. <laughs> sure, I'm sure you have more than me on this, so I'll yeah, just go just first. Just like clarifying, clarifying, clarifying questions. Nothing too major, but I hopefully they'll, they'll get it. But go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, staff, for the, this presentation. I really appreciate you guys going and doing a deeper dive and bringing us back with the additional, additional data. You know, as, as I say, every time we talk about Tempe Pre, it's, a, it's very near and dear to me. It's obviously a resounding success, um, you know, not only for the children, but, but for their families and economic opportunities that, that it provides them. Um, you know, it is, it is certainly my desire that this program continue in Tempe and be made permanent after we, from the chart, we've you know, already spent $11 million on this program. So, I, you know, I know that it's the task of this committee to come up with a, a permanent source so that we can stop asking the council year after year for uh, additional funding. Um, you know, and I think we're going to get there. I, I'm certainly not ready to give any direction um, at this meeting because I know that there's some details that me and council member Aaron Savage kind of want to work on together to try to come up with a, um, you know, a, a unified recommendation to the, the full council before bringing it to them. But this was certainly very helpful. Um, I do have additional questions, but I don't think that they're appropriate for for you right now, I think it's just getting some numbers from from my council aid on various um, avenues we could use to um, potentially provide a permanent funding sources to this program. So um, 
I think for now, this is from, from my point of view, um, you know, we're going to take this back, me and Councilman Barry Nando Savage kind of mull it over and get the other and, and try to throw some things around and kind of see what sticks. But I certainly would want to see this program be a permanent fixture of the fabric of the city of Tempe. And, and I'm very confident that we'll get there. So I really appreciate all the work you've all done on this. It's been a long road to get to the point we're at now. But um, I think Tempe, all Tempeans should be very proud of, of the positive impact um, that this program has had and the role that you all have played in facilitating it. So thank you very much. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Yeah, you. Savage, you're up. Hey, yeah, cool. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And you know what? The Vice Mayor stole a lot of my thunder too, because it is has it has been a lot of work. And and I say it all the time. Things don't just happen because they happen or we throw money at it. They happen because we have a lot of really awesome people that want to make it happen and they care and they they put their blood, work, and and sweat and tears into creating something that's really unique and uh, pretty remarkable, I think, for this community. So I just, just want to say, of course, thank you to everybody uh, that's been a part of it and, and the evolution and our partners. Obviously, we couldn't have done a lot of this without our partners. Um, you can see what they've had impact-wise. And, and then to be able to have the data that shows the success and the continued success, I think that's going to be great, not just for our community, but for those that want to come after us. So I, I think that stuff is invaluable, but I do have a few follow-up questions. And if you don't have the information, I think that's that's totally fine. Um, <clears throat> I think we all want to get to the same place. It's just a matter of how we get there and create something that's that's permanent and that, you know, we have to be cognizant of council members too is, you know, this was had always been the, that one time type money and we didn't we don't have it worked into the budget. So whatever we do moving forward either has to come out of the general fund or we find a new revenue source. And, you know, that's why we're here and I would challenge everybody too. And I know you come up with an idea of, of a tax, but I, I would really challenge our staff to be creative and think outside the box and see where there may be other ways that we could possibly, you know, uh, look for revenue sources. And maybe it's a new idea. Maybe we borrow an idea from another city. I don't really know. Um, but I mean, I think there's definitely opportunity. And like the vice mayor said, I know him and I are, are going to sit down and, and work through a few things and, um, you know, hopefully come back with a, a really good solution moving forward. I do have a couple of questions. I don't know if it's for Marie or who this may be, but you mentioned the subsidy payments. I'm assuming those haven't been worked into any budget yet. And those aren't things that we're receiving now. Do you have any idea of what that would generate regarding funding for the future? And hopefully I understood that correctly. Yeah, so, um, so uh, we're just in our infancy, literally of, of accepting those subsidies. I think we maybe have one or two families who qualify. Um, so, um, it, you know, it, it all depends on how many uh, families in any given classroom would qualify for the subsidy and at what amount, because it depends on their income level. Um, so we could, um, you know, I, I guess best case scenario would be that, you know, half of our half of each of our class would um, would qualify. So we'd bring in maybe uh, 3000 a month per classroom. Um, and again, that's best case scenario that about half of the classroom would qualify. So we'll 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 know a bit better um, by the end of this year, and and certainly by the beginning of next year, what that could potentially look like. Well, and I think that's kind of to me that's new revenue that we haven't seen before. So I think it'd be really important that we try to capture that the best that we can as we move forward too, because I, you know I just don't want it to ruin, you know, the good work that we're going to try to do to create something um, so we can keep pre-K for a long time. And so I want to make sure that we are working that into the equation. So the more you can learn about that information, I think that would be really helpful. That would be, um, at least for me, that would be really important to know that information. And then the one thing I was wondering too, we, I know we talked a lot about the, you mentioned the $510,000 from um, uh, the Piper Foundation and that a lot of that was going to like fees and things to that effect in professional development, which I'm a huge, firm believer in professional development. I just would kind of like to know in regards to our teachers, what's what's our retention and what's what's our turnover? How's that been going? Allie, can you speak to that? Um, well, I can certainly speak to uh, what I came into this year. Um, I, I would have to go back and, and uh, review years past because I'm relatively new to it, but um, all of our teachers uh, this year are returning teachers um, and we definitely have uh, within this group um, 
all of the uh, returning teachers have been here for the duration of the program. Um, so, uh, or from the start of the program rather, um, but because we downsized in classrooms, you know, then obviously we've lost some teachers that way. So, um, for example, this year we have one teacher that, um, you know, moved out of the Tempe pre-program last year, uh, but has returned this year. She was teaching a different grade level last year. So, um, you know, we've got right now 100% this year, I would have to kind of do a little evaluating to see exactly where people have landed and come and gone with the changing uh, number of classrooms. Got you. Okay. Well, it, yeah, I mean, I think, I, and like I said, it just feels like we invest a lot of money in professional development. So it would be great to know, you know, kind of what that retention looks like and, you know, moving forward, how hard that's going to be to staff and, um, and Ellie, you may not know this, but Marie, you may know this, and I don't, and I and I apologize. I used to know this when we originally started this program that you know Tempe Elementary had their own preschool program too. Have, have are they still doing their own, or has it all been combined together? And you know what does that look like? You know how has that been going, or what's that look like in the future? Yeah, Allie may have more accurate information than oh. I do. I know I know they um, downsized the number. They have a TOTS preschool program, um, and the TOTS program uh, at, was not a full day program like Tempe Pre. Um, it was a half day program, and um, I'm not sure exactly how many TOTS classrooms are left. Um, I'm not sure if Allie well, knows that. They, they do still okay. have. And their you know what, Allie, is something that we can talk about. I guess what I want to know is, I know when we started this program, Tempe Elementary had a preschool program. Mm -hmm. And um, they did have a lot of partners that helped keep it going. I guess what I would like to know is just a little bit more of what that partnership looks like and what their what Tempe L's perspective is and Kyrene's perspective is and what they've done in the past and how this has impacted them and, and you know, kind of what they would like to see moving forward. But we can work on that. You don't have to answer that today. So put that in your notes, Allie. We can we can have that conversation. And Got then it. thank you. And then hey, Ken Jones, if you're still there. I'm wondering, I noticed in Pima County when they were talking about doing this, which to me is going to be a one one hit wonder if this works out, but they're going to be using ARPA funds. What do you think about that? Um, well, I think we have ARPA funds that we're struggling to try to get figure out a way to use those to move our yards currently. So that's one time funding and we're right. trying to figure out how we can use that to supplant other costs so that we actually have the funds to move the traffic ops yard and the priest yard. Uh, we're struggling with that a little bit. I don't, I don't think there are any ARPA funds sitting around that aren't going to be used. <laughs> Got it. I don't know. I, yeah, I, well, that's what I was kind of wondering, like kind of what, where, what our expectations are um, in regards to those definitely already being maxed, maxed out. And plus, I think we got to remember those are just one-time funds too, right? So we'd be right yeah. back to where we are. And that's why I, lo I was looking at Pima County thinking, man, they're going to be in trouble because that's two years of funding and then they're done. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, trying to find out something that's a little bit more permanent. And then, um, hey, so Allie, I'd like to have a little bit more of a conversation and not today. And you know, when we have a con to, to talk a little bit about that year of 2019, because the 2019 year seemed to be like one of those years, obviously right before COVID with the 365 number of free. And then we had 59 half and then 24 that paid in full. And I'm, I'm a, I'm thinking if I got that number right, that generated like $330,000 of tuition for that year. But I just kind of want to go over those numbers and, and just see if you guys have thought about, you know, creating some more flexibility to allow more tuition paying, or is that our max number with the number of classrooms we have? So I just need to understand that just a little bit better because yeah, of course we'd like to serve everybody. And I know that would be a really remarkable thing with everything we do, whatever it may be, whether it's, you know, youth programs, special needs, kids, homeless individuals, we want to be able to do everything. But at the same time, I think we need to know what is a really good balance moving forward. And that to me means, um, you know, we're going to do our best with what we can and to create something that's sustainable. And we may have to be flexible on that. So if we could maybe just talk a little bit about what, like that, um, what that tuition might look like moving forward and how we can expand on that or what kind of impact that's had that would be really helpful to me moving forward but um again i think those are just my questions in regards to just really making sure i have a full good understanding of of where we are but also where we want to be too and, and what we're comfortable with as we have to balance our budget for everybody um in this community and that's really important to me so when you look at a cost of 9.54 million dollars that that just 
that uh, is really kind of scary to me, but maintaining where we're at and, and really trying to create something that's sustainable for the future. I think to me, we're going to have to just be a little bit more realistic and, and see what that looks like. So uh, with that, Vice Mayor, those are my 2 cents. Um, and again, I just appreciate the work of everybody and everything that you continue to do. And hopefully we'll be able to come together with some really solid solutions moving forward. And Ken Jones, I expect you to go find some cash somewhere. Thank you. No problem. Thank you very much, Council Member Arenado Savage. Um, with that, we move on to our next item, which is um, let me see on my thing here. Uh, the next item on the agenda for this committee is new items for consideration. Council Member Arenado Savage, do you have any new items? That I haven't already discussed, Vice Mayor. I think I'm good. Yeah, me either. So, uh, Council Member Arenado Savage, do you have any announcements? I do not, Vice Mayor. Okay, well, with that, our next meeting is Monday, October 25th at 3 p.m. and we are adjourned. All right, thanks. Thanks, Vice Mayor. Thanks, Alex. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.